so it's 535, 538, and we'll convene the third and final privacy meeting. What, what's the official title of these meetings? Privacy? Privacy hearings. Privacy hearings. And do you want to keep it? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Clarkson. <laughs> uh, why don't we ask uh, for those on the phone just to introduce yourselves? Yeah, this is Gary Morris, coming for Bridget Morris. We're with the lobbying firm Morris with the MAG, and we're very interested to hear how the discussion is going tonight. How are you, Jerry? Has left the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else on the phone? Strong start. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is Ben Peters with Common Sense Media. Uh, we were we attended a couple and uh, we weren't able to make it out for this time. So I'm just dialing in tonight. Good call because we're all going to be snowed in in the auditorium tonight. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, they, thanks for participa uh, participating. We appreciate it. Uh, anybody else on the phone? General, it's Tim Wilkerson from the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association. Hi, how you doing, Tim? Excellent. And I'm sorry I'm not up there. That's OK. I afraid I wouldn't get out tomorrow. You, you, you made a good call. Uh, Jerry Moore. <laughs> Joins the conference. <laughs> I got cut off. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me get your napkin. Yes. <laughs> Why don't we just go around really quickly because this isn't that big of a room um, and just introduce ourselves and uh, who you are, where you're from. TJ Donovan, Attorney General. I'm Charity Clark. I'm the Attorney General's Chief of Staff. Ryan Krieger, Assistant Attorney General, Public Protection Division. Chris Curtis, Chief of the Public Protection Division. Uh, Clay Purvis, Department of Public Service. Lauren Yondel, Small Business Advocate, Vermont Attorney General's Office. Sol by Overbeyond, former IT person for federal law office. Tony Marshall, State Archivist, Chief Records Officer, State of Vermont. Zach Cominelli, VPERC. Thomas Weiss, President of Montpelier. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Kingman, Council of State Privacy and Security Coalition. Kate Davey, nobody in particular. Well, you are Kate Davey. I am Kate Davey. Allison Clarkson. Uh, Ryan Munt from Waco Junction. Becky Lewandowski, DRM. Uh, Chris Doerr from Madison, PC. David Mavell, also from Madison, PC. And Ari Shard, also from Madison. Ted Fisher from AOE. Adam McGrassen, McGrassen Group, Multi Client Government Affairs. Dylan Zwicky, Wayne Public Affairs. Chris Rice, MMR. Tracy Camino, player citizen. Jen Kennedy, Kennedy Associates, and I'm here for CDIA and TV. Great. Well, thanks for uh, everybody coming out tonight. Uh, as I said, this is the, the third and final uh, privacy hearing. I think at the conclusion of this, we will issue a joint report um, about. Uh, these hearings and some of the questions that we were charged with uh, investigating and researching and, and attempting to answer. And I think there's consensus, at least from the AG's office, as to two issues. Uh, number one, and I believe Senator uh, Sorokin has already put in a request to draft this bill, is on student privacy. Uh, it's something that we certainly support. Uh, the second issue would be for a chief privacy officer for the state of Vermont. Uh, we, view the, we view that position as uh, an internal position looking at the state's policies and procedures and certainly trying to answer the question about what the state does with its own data uh, and whether or not there should be some regs as to uh, whether or not we sell it or should sell it or sell it to whom. To whom. whom. Um, the third question, um, I think the, th the third question was, should we seek to modify or amend the data broker bill now law from last session? I think the consensus was no. 
uh, I think everybody's comfortable with that and uh, see how that develops. And the fourth question was whether or not Vermont should adopt uh, the FCC uh, standards. Um, and I don't think we have an answer as to that yet, uh, although I think there is growing consensus that we should probably wait for California. Uh, in my understanding, they're in the process of uh, uh, developing those rules uh, for 2020. Does that sound right? Um, and that has really been uh, the last two meetings. So, and those were the specific questions I believe that we were charged by the legislature to address. And we'll produce a report uh, sometime in December uh, answering those questions. Um, so, why don't I just open it up and ask for uh, questions, concerns. Uh, other ideas that should be given consideration or things that we haven't yet addressed or should address. Um, so why don't I do that first? I wonder, uh, General, just by way of context for folks that may be watching on cable access or who may be joining us for the first time, if you're local citizens and you haven't participated in any of the prior hearings, one of the reasons that I think we've uh, found some consensus on some of these uh, ideas is because we, we've spent uh, two uh, public fora already, several hours of discussion with stakeholders, other concerned citizens, um, and uh, the issues of student privacy are issues that other states have dealt with already. So those states have, there are some states that have those laws on the books. Um, and so as Vermont looks to uh, how do we be in the vanguard of protecting our citizens, in particular students? That was an area where pretty quickly it seemed like there was an emerging consensus that um, that is a model that other states have already adopted, that industry has already adapted to, and that provides a certain threshold of protection for those students. So that just appeared to be a common sense approach that uh, you know we felt pretty comfortable that uh, a recommendation in that area makes sense for Vermont. So if you're just coming at this for the first time, that's, that's uh, something that we thought was uh, a good step in the right direction that made sense. And on a chief privacy officer, I just think we've had a general sense that there's a discussion around what is happening generally with um, uh, protecting the privacy and data of consumers generally. And if that is a question that we take seriously in the commercial context, uh, should there not be uh, a person who is charged with looking at that issue in the context of citizen data? And so state government, of course, has a huge trove of data and knows a lot about its citizens because citizens have to interact with the government every day in a myriad of different ways. Um, so a chief privacy officer who's really tasked with looking at that, again, I think there's a small handful of other states that have created that position uh, maybe a half a dozen uh, uh, that have already acted in that area. But that just seems to be a very practical, common sense thing to do. Um, obviously, it would require an allocation of resources by the legislature because it would be a new position in state government. Um, it might be a position that would work closely with existing entities, but would be have a very specific charge. So it would be working with the Secretary of State's office, for example, It'd be working with um, the ADS, uh, for example. So there's a lot of ground there to cover, and that could look a lot of different ways depending on how the legislature might construct that. But we think it's an interesting idea, and it's one that we had a lot of discussion about in prior uh, public hearing. So it's come up and it's one that the legislature has already indicated some interest in in the past. So we just thought revisiting that and flagging it as that's an area that's ripe for discussion just makes sense uh, for this report. So that's just a little bit of context on those issues. Yeah. To, to give further context actually, so we've thrown out the term student privacy a number of times and what do we mean by student privacy? What does that look like? There's already a federal law, FERPA, that basically controls or uh, put some restrictions on what schools can do with their student data. The proposals that have been put forth, uh, the law which started in California was called SOPIPA, uh, Student Online Personal Information Protection Act. 
And this is not so much targeted at the schools as at the education technology industry or ed tech. And uh, I don't have any kids in school, but uh, I guess there's a lot of technology in school, cloud-based technology, uh, companies that provide apps, Google has a, pro a product, and students, generally speaking, don't really have a choice as to whether or not to use these apps or not. If the teacher, or the administration decides this app or website or whatever is being <coughs> used, then the students use it. There may be consent or not, I, I'm not sure. And so what SOPIPA does is basically, and the devil is in the details, and that might be something that gets argued about, what it basically does is puts restrictions on what an ed tech company can do with the data that it collects. So in the absence of any restrictions, presumably, one of these companies can collect student data, package it up, create a profile, sell it, use it for targeted advertising, uh, use it to rank a student or grade them, and you know, basically create a permanent record of that student which will travel with them forever. That would be in the absence of any regulation. And so this might say, uh, if you're collecting a profile on a student, you can only use it for the educational purpose that you have been implemented to do, and you can't sell it on, or you can't use it for uh, um, targeted advertising. There are about 20 states that already have laws like this in place, and they're all a little bit different than each other. So that is what we're talking about when we talk about student privacy in this context. It's the education technology industry and what they are doing with student data. Great, thanks. So let me open it up to the audience for questions, concerns, thoughts, suggestions. Yeah, I mean, we want to hear from you about what's important to you as we have this discussion and move things forward. So Zach Kamenelli with VPERC. Um, we've already submitted written comments with a lot of our, our um, interest here. Um, I think several of our members uh, have emailed the Attorney General's office uh, mostly today um, about their thoughts on, on some of these issues. I want to just touch briefly on, on three. Um, so in terms of, you mentioned the FCC rules and the FCC broadband privacy um, and waiting for California. I don't want to open up a whole, uh, two of these hearings we discussed a lot about the California law. I think people on both sides of this consumer or business side all sort of agree that a lot of the California law needs to be worked out. However, the broadband privacy rules, the FCC rules, while not specifically included in that California law, I want to make the argument are referenced as part of some of the broader stuff there. That's a very specific item. That's the uh, idea of whether or not internet service providers specifically need to get opt-in permission from, uh, from their, their customers in order to monetize their data. So we would argue, and I'm not saying that there's consensus on this, but I would just want to make sure that uh, it's out there that we believe that Vermont does not need to wait for California on that sort of thing. We would be pushing and arguing for Vermont to move forward with enacting the broadband privacy FCC rules. So that's just that. Just wanted to make that distinction of that. that that's yeah. not all of California, which is much more sort of far reaching. Uh, and then just in terms of getting things on the table, this was brought up last time, but it's worth putting out there again. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to revisit the state's Data Breach Notification Act. Um, we don't have a specific policy proposal, but as we know, data breach notification right now uh, refers specifically to personally identifiable information. That's sort of a narrow subset of name plus social security number, name plus credit card, that sort of thing. And it would be worth taking a look at and deciding, does that really represent how data is contained and managed today? So for instance, if somebody were uh, you know, to lose an email and a credit card, I don't believe, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, that that combination is not triggering for data breach notification, right? So the question is, you know, with a lot of these databases now separating out different pieces of information, names are being kept here, but other uh, sensitive information being kept here, do we need to revisit what that looks like? So I raise that. And then this is just really not fully baked, but since you said getting things out on the table, so that in the interest of getting out of here, um, similar to what we were talking about with student privacy, the idea of um, medical data or health data, um, you know, we have, uh, HIPAA, obviously, but one of the issues with the sectoral approach to data in this country is that it does leave gaps and holes, and uh, HIPAA really uh, deals with actors and not the data itself. So um, there could be non-medical you know, institutions or whatever holding on to, and medical data is some of the most sensitive and important data out there. Um, so I'm admitting that this is half-baked, I'm not, but whether or not uh, some of the smart people in the Attorney General's office can take a look at um, 
what there could be done about medical data, especially non sort of non HIPAA covered people holding medical medical data, and what are some of the uh, things that we could be doing there to better protect that. So uh, those are just three things to. Thanks, Zach. Chris. Uh, Chris Dorr from Edelson, PC. Uh, to expand on that last point, just raising the question of like what is medical data and what can be done to protect it. Um, I think we raised this a little bit before, but the question of things like biometrics and genetics that um, HIPAA is a terribly outdated statute at this point and doesn't have the effectiveness that it should. Um, and those are two you know, big areas that are not well covered. So I would just raise that as a question. That's a good point. Include that type of data, which is being held, but like you're saying, by companies that are not traditional actors in the medical space at all. Um, genetic testing companies like 23andMe or biometrics held by numerous consumer companies, social media companies, things of that nature. Tom? Um, I've been concerned about, I guess, the, the fractionalization of, of categories somewhat what, what he mentioned. And I think we shouldn't be concerned, I mean, we should be concerned about the data and not the category. If it's medical data, it should apply to students and to medical people. If it's financial data, it should apply to everybody equally. And first of all, determine what data need protection and then determine what level of protection various groupings of data get. And then once we figure that out, we say, okay, for students, it's these categories and this is how it gets protected. And if it's something that students have and that medical patients have in common, it gets protected the same way. And it gets protected the same way whether it's in the hands of an internet service provider, in the hands of somebody that we call a data broker, or it's in the hands of somebody that we call having a direct relationship with a, uh, a consumer. I, I think those categories are um, not irrelevant, but they're, they're not the categories we ought to be focusing yeah. on. I think first we ought to be focusing on the data that we protect and yeah. how to how it gets protected and then dividing it up then. If you're in one of these various categories, these are the data elements that get protected yep. and this is, everybody gets done the same way. Yeah, I, Tom, I tend to agree with you. It's, it's the how, which, you know, going back to Zach's point about, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's a question, do you wait or not? It, it's a question of can you pass a law um, that will withstand legal challenge? Um, and I go back to my fundamental question, I think that I started the first hearing with, that in a rapidly changing world, can the law keep up with technology? And are we gonna be passing laws every year to try to keep up? Because my sense is we're gonna be doing these hearings uh, on an annual basis. And so I go back to, to, to the how, um, also looking at the federal landscape to see if there will be action there or not. Um, but uh, certainly to, to lead on this, but to lead on it in a way uh, that is effective in that we pass legislation uh, that withstands challenge. Um, and. I'm, I think we can all agree that this is a landscape that's changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do think it's important to look at the national landscape, uh, the federal landscape, and to look at what states are doing as well. I mean, um, I mean, perhaps somebody can answer this question you know, on the net neutrality stuff. I thought a reasonable act for a state to 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 take. Uh, obviously, we're now in litigation, which is fine. Um, do we want to be in a constant state of litigation? Um, maybe we do. Um, 
So I think there's a lot of factors on this, and I think it goes to Tom's point about that. It, it's really the how do we do this most effectively that protects from honors, that also, I think, sends a message, though, too, um, that Vermont is part of the global economy. Vermont is part of the digital economy. And we want to be part of that economy. Uh, but that is not to abdicate our responsibility uh, to our community members to protect their privacy. And so I, sh I struggle with the how looking at really two different landscapes. I think it's second the point there, the difference between a student, you know, the reasoning around student data protection and reasoning around the citizen data protection because we're obligated to interact with the state is not so different. And I would argue that the how is the key. While we don't have the answer yet, the work that we can do and the resources that we apply to solving that problem in one instance from a technical basis will provide us the same tools to protect that in any other context. And I think the biggest key is not so much defining and trying to regulate how we hold data, but focus on how we interact with data and push the data down to the user. So that reduces our overall risk exposure. So instead of having these data silos where someone can see 125 million records, we have individual silos for each one of us where, yes, there may be a high value target at times, but that can be known and addressed. But the value of hacking 145 million individual people, that, that, that's a high cost to business and really mitigates the issue of data security, which is the other component of this hearing. Yeah, no, good point. Well, that's an interesting point, right? Like, so we're talking about privacy sort of writ large, but a lot of what we're talking about is security. Mm -hmm. So, but privacy and security are in some ways different, different things, right? So, I mean, that, that's a really important uh, distinction to make, and we need to be clear about what it is exactly that we're trying to accomplish uh, through these, these efforts. Um, but I do know, I mean, security is constantly on people's minds because they read in the news or they hear about a security breach and they wonder, am I exposed somehow? Somebody can steal my idea. What do I do in that? Head left the conference. So, so I just I think that's a great point, and we, we need to be able to clearly distinguish between the two and figure out where they overlap, and then be conscious about what we're trying to accomplish. And what I would present as a suggestion is that if we can establish the role of a privacy individual, like the director or a chief privacy officer, chief privacy officer, that their objective may be to identify areas of uh, resource. Uh, expenditure in different departments in different areas of the state that can be collaborated specifically toward security, data management, uh, and, and sort of development of those technologies to, to interface. And if we can do that in open technologies, open resource, open source technology, we can also find a community of other contributors from around the world that are building similar things and uh, hopefully leverage those resources for our own Uh, Tanya Marshall, Chief Records Officer of State Air Fitness. Um, just for full disclosure, my background is actually in information sciences. That's my, that's my degree. Um, so a lot of the things we're going to talk about, the how, that's actually one of the things that newer legislation that was just passed this year are getting is that, you know, when we talk about records or public records management, and that's only scope that I will talk about because it's not outside of that, is, you know, we talked last time at the last privacy hearing that the state's pretty immature in terms of governing information. It's been a struggle, um, even for myself, being in this position for, I've been in the state for 15 years, um, of watching people's mindset go from a, a box of paper records and not really understanding. So the how part of it is actually structured currently in the legislation through Act 100 of this past year about information governance, which that's really where you get all these different factors. Um, you know, the key part for information governance really runs on pretty much eight principles. One is accountability, who's responsible. The second is transparency. How well is it documented? Not transparency, and think of government accountability, transparency, but really documentation so everyone understands what they have. Integrity, the accuracy of information. So although we're talking about privacy, obviously when we're collecting information of any means from the state or from individuals, it's about to provide a service, so there's integrity aspects to it. Protection is a huge principle within that, so that's the next one. We also have compliance. So anytime there is a law, how do you actually comply with it? And how do you have that relationship to maybe advise that 
or recommend when the legislation isn't quite accurately aligning with the other part of it. Um, availability, obviously for any entity you want to have your information available to do your job um, as required, and then retention and disposition. Um, for the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, we often, oftentimes people classify us in the retention and disposition. When can I get rid of something? When can I destroy it? And that is something that we do. But we do all the other factors. And so as you look at the Chief Privacy Officer, and I know we haven't submitted written comments yet, but I really see the collaboration aspect because the how is something I've spent, you know, 15 years in the state of Vermont, kind of social science experiment in some ways with me watching how these things come about, but the, really the how is not what we've always done very well. And it doesn't mean that we have breaches or things happening, but we definitely have a disconnect when it comes to here's the legislation, here are the individuals working, here's the kind of information that's written and recorded. How do you actually manage that in a responsible way in compliance with the laws that are required at the federal and state level? Everybody <laughs> It'll help my job, but I also don't want to side because what will happen is something can get passed that's very much siloed, so it's so focused on privacy that the hows never happen, and that's really what the information governance framework is about. I think that's a great point, and it's you know whatever we do, we want it to be effective. And if, exactly. we, if we don't build the framework or the, the foundation, if you will, uh, first, I mean, I, I think you know with this. Sometimes we get caught up in the, you know, I don't want to call it the headline, but we, for, we forget the foundational work in the state government that if we pass something, well, you better be able to enforce it. Well, if we don't have the resources to enforce it, then what are we doing? And if we're coming back every year because there's a new um, issue, um, and we haven't done the, the foundational work within, within the state, I, I think you raise a really fair point, and that, I mean, so that's what I keep coming back to on this, and I, look, our job is to protect people, um, and how best to do that, I think, in, in a world that's changing rapidly, um, that's going to require the state government to look internally first, um, as opposed to just responding, um, I, I think, to each crisis. Um, and I think we really need to reflect, and I, I appreciate your, your remarks. And I do need just, we have a chief data officer as well, and we have a weekly meeting. Um, so those things are the things that we're trying to combine because really under, you know, data is just a subset of public records um, and definition. Um, so when it comes to the protection for the technology focus, but again, it's about those foundations, those pillars, because one, I always describe it when we do trainings, it's, it's kind of like you're building a porch. You have one pillar that's short. You're not, you're not actually having a full foundation that for, you know, something that's, so you have these eight pillars of the state principles for information governance. And when they're at a certain different level, and there's ways to rate them. So even when we look at why a breach might have happened, if it happened in the state government, the first thing that we do is analyze where, where at level is that agency at it to all these different areas of information governance. And oftentimes we can drill down to what the problem was, you know, and what caused it versus a reactive, which might be legislation, but what was the real cause of the problem and, and distilling that down um, to understand it to fix it. Are there other members of the general public that have, oh, John, you got this is probably a detail, but if you are, and, and I admit to not recalling if it came up in legislative committees, either in House Commerce or in Economic Development in the Senate, but if, I know they talked about us looking at a chief privacy officer. Is there any uh, decision yet on, on your part of where this would reside in the state government? For those on the phone, the, the, if you couldn't quite hear it, the question was, is there any indication of where the chief privacy officer might reside within state government if the state should elect to go down that road? Tanya made a really good argument for the Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's definitely, you know, I would, I'm not advocating in either direction. Mine is more collaboration. Yeah. Because it feels yeah. all a concerted effort together. I, I, I don't know. Uh, is is the quick answer. I really don't. I mean, it should be wherever it's going to be most effective. Thank you. 
Well, I just wonder, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces in the, the audience, folks that have participated actively throughout this process, but I'm also seeing some, some new faces, uh, members of the general public. So I just thought, you know, if there's anything on your mind, you don't have to be an expert in any of this stuff. I'm, I'm curious, within public protection, about just what are you thinking about these issues? What, what concerns you? What, uh, where do you think the opportunities are? Um, is there anything in particular that made you want to come out to this meeting tonight? So I'd love to hear from new folks that we haven't had an opportunity to hear from before uh, about what's on your mind and what you think is important in terms of uh, protecting the privacy of, of Vermonters. I, have, I wanted to direct your attention to a very um, interesting book that I came across called The Closing of the Net. It's by Monica Horton. I have, I, I have a copy I'm going to leave with you. I'm also going to leave you uh, copies of the first chapter, which is called Power and the Internet. And the reason that I, I, I haven't watched the first two hearings, but I have been involved in IT for over 25 years. And, and I've been very concerned about the lack of understanding of the public of what this whole data mining, data profiling is really about. It's not just they're going to put a different advertisement for you than the next person. It's really, really filtering people's access to uh, reality and the information that's knowledge that, that upon which we all operate as a civic democracy. And I just happened to stumble on this book when I was in London. It comes from a person who's from London. Monica Horton is a, uh, from the London School of Economics. Um, and she makes a lot of points. And in this first chapter, you're going to find a lot of it. I mean, it, from her perspective, data is the new oil in the world economy. That's really one of her, point, her, her important points. And, 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 and that the internet service providers and the applications are the ones that actually have the power to shape access to knowledge, which is the basis of all of our civic decision making. And people don't realize how I can do a Google search and I'm going to get certain results back, and you're going to do the same one, and you're going to get something completely different. And both of us feel like we've, we've really figured out the world's reality and what the information is and the best deal, or I can go try to get a flight on a flight, uh, you know, purchase an airline ticket, and because I know I paid eight hundred and thirty-five dollars the last time I went to Paris, they're not going to get too far away from charging me that same price. Or oh, maybe you get fifty dollars off. The next person is going to be getting a different quote. There's just so many things about it, and I totally get your, you know, Attorney General, your your concern about every year we're going to be doing this again and again and again, because I. I really feel like we are very ignorant as a population. We don't have any way to educate people yeah. about this and how it's, and, and we saw in the way the election is people get a Facebook post and they immediately pass it on. I asked a couple high school kids, when you get a Facebook post, do you check the, res the sources before you send it along? No. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, so education is gonna be part of this process. I'm, I'm really feeling your pain of how do we make legislation. It's not just protecting it in the silos or it's 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 educating people and also how do you actually I think I think uh, dealing with the commercial um, collection of it and use of it, wh wh which is where I think part of what you're talking about is has to be addressed is that it can't be pro you know consolidated and profiled to the point where, where everybody's being, their worldview is being manipulated, and how can we ever have a civic society when we, everybody's getting a different view of reality? So I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to approach the. Give, give me your thoughts. <laughs> give, 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 give me your thoughts on the how part. I've been trying to, I've been struggling with the how. Me too. Um, because, because I think a lot of it is education. There's a book called, another book, I love to proselytize with books, called <laughs> Program or Be Programmed. It's a Douglas Rushkoff book. Thank you so much. And, and he really goes into the 10 educational things you need to think about. You don't need to be a programmer, but you do need to understand the fact that the programmers have completely created your worldview. They've made it so you only have two choices for gender when you go through one of their apps. That's their decision, and you don't have any choice. But so program or be programmed. 
it's edu education is I think going to be a lot of it. Yeah. Um, legally, I think the thing about not you know not people being able to um, the opt-in and opt-out. You, you you have to have the default position being the data belongs to you. And there's a lot going on in Europe. And so she, Monica Horton, who wrote this book, uh, The Closing of the Net, really focuses a lot on that because they're ahead of the game with their whole general data protection regulation. So we have a lot to learn about that. So I think it's sort of somehow figure out how to define Vermont's uh, citizens' data as, as owned by them and and then and, and 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 then find make mechanisms for the business people who really have legitimate needs to do it because people do appreciate uh, getting a recommendation of a book that just came out that happens to be uh, you know on the target of you know, the stuff they like so I I feel like the the, the data is owned by the user the the person and they need a way to be able to opt in for things that are of interest to them and they need to be able to correct inaccuracies but it's very tricky so I will continue to try to think about it but you will find this this chapter power in the internet incredibly and it, and it goes beyond there it goes to not commercial uses but actually government use as well governments go through data so there's a lot of symbiosis between the commercial use of the data and governments who want to be able to filter in you know more nefarious purposes in other countries right now besides us so Nate, thank you. That was That's, that was great, and I must thank like, you for I must really appreciate have you go out and talk to everybody in the state <laughs> <laughs> well, because you make I, a lot I of sense. We to find a way to educate well, people. We I talk. go to any conference I can, and particularly young people and people that are, uh, you know, school and principals, you know, friends of mine that are educators. Those are the people that need to be helped. I agree. I, mean, I think this issue it, it's ubiquitous, but it's overwhelming to people, right? It, it, it's okay. To your point, I have to do this. If I want to get a flight, if I want to, and it's, I don't think people know their rights, and I agree with you about how do we raise, edu educate the awareness and the education part. That's where the real change comes from. I think that requires us back to the foundational part to actually become truly subject matter experts on this in a rapidly changing world um, and to create change and to make progress where we can not to always get back bogged down on the big stuff because it's it, it's empowering people at the end of the day. I, I think that's going to make the change here. Well, you have to acknowledge the fact that there are solid business reasons for people to have the data and using it. So you can't put us in opposite ends and say it's either the privacy, you yeah. know, I want to be private, or I'm a business person, I want it all yeah. because I don't want to have to onesie twosies try to get approval from you for that or this or that. So this is where the challenge is. You have to recognize we have people that are incredible entrepreneurs that want to, you know, do cool things, and and people want free stuff, and so and they're getting free free software and apps and everything. So I don't want to shut down the opportunity for people to actually get that when they have great ideas for yeah. business. I think that we just need to make sure it's private for the people, yeah. and then and then you have to think it through. How can you make it so there are opportunities? Yeah. There there are legitimate ways to access that information for the people that are doing wonderful things with software and, and, and data. Well said, and I, I go back to let's, let's protect people's privacy, but let's also uh, have Vermont uh, be able to compete in a digital economy. Uh, that, that's a big part of this too. Well, that's what, that's yeah, what I'm saying. I, we agree. You don't want to shut it down. Nope. Need. If I can comment on, on your comment, um, part of civics education. So Secretary of State's office used to run a civics education under the previous secretary. Um, and per our efforts of bringing it back, but one of the things that we're including, it had been more focused on elections, but given on the last election round and now digital literacy, which I see as a core part of people understanding when you, you know, um, I have three high schoolers, so I see this all the time about, you know, finding something on, you know, it's different than how we did research. Uh, but digital literacy is understanding the validity of what you're reading and then also understanding how the technology can shape what you're seeing as a consumer. So I see a lot of value in that and, and I would strongly make a recommend some of the recommendation whether that's underneath the hat of any of the three categories or subcategory is about this 
this part about being part of a larger society is that one, we have to be better educated about what we're reading. And this always has happened, but um, if it can be combined into some civics education, especially at a younger age. So as maybe as part of like the student privacy component, it's not just always about the technology they're using, because I see that as well. A lot of you know, teachers are uninformed of how to, and, and schools are doing that, where there's all sorts of technologies that are you know, collecting student data. Um, as they're using that, but the individuals who are making the purchasing don't know or understand the context of what they're, what they're making the purchasing on, and the students also don't know. So there's an opportunity to dovetail it into civics education that also includes digital literacy, that also includes consumer protection at the same time and doing that you know, at an earlier level. So maybe that's a component for the student aspect. So your hand did go up earlier. Um, so um, there actually is an infrastructure in place in the state that will provide information literacy for every Vermont public school student. The problem is it's kind of under siege right now. School librarian positions and school librarian assistant positions are being cut across the state. And they are the folks who know how to teach kids the difference between um, fake news and real news. They know how to teach the kids how to do reverse image search. They know how to teach the kids how to identify dicey websites. They know those things. They're up to date on those things. But they can't um, impart that information to the students if they're horribly understaffed. But it's the, the, the structure is there. If the schools can, if we can find certified librarians for the schools to hire, to, to do the, the teacher, to play the teacher librarian role the way they know they can, um, that it's already in place. Um, ready to go. Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, Ari Jarre from Allison. <coughs> I just want to kind of lean into this idea that a privacy law would have a negative impact um, on the state's competitiveness in terms of the digital age. Um, at, at their core, I guess, for pri privacy laws are just transparency laws. They're not regulating um, the technologies in, in really any way. They're just saying these types of data and information are considered important, and you can't take them from people without telling them. Um, and when companies are transparent with people, consumers have the ability to make choices about which businesses they want to do business with. Um, I think if you talk, or you know, if you if you hear from um, small and, 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 and medium-sized tech companies that are not Google, that are not Facebook, they are dying for transparency because they think that that's the only way that, that they're going to be able to get competitive with those folks. If everybody had to put their data practices on the, the line um, for consumers to see, um, a lot of these companies feel that consumers would go away from the, the Silicon Valley companies and towards the smaller and medium-sized tech companies. Um, so I just want to make that point. I appreciate it. Just stepping off of Ari's point, do we have anyone here representing any local Vermont ISPs? Your hand, your hand sort yeah. of went up. <laughs> so a couple of things. One, I want to kind of back that, that um, not only small tech companies, but residents. If we can put the right technology in place, we can flip the way social media monetizes data so that the individual is actually getting compensated for what is truly theirs. And it doesn't matter what we've agreed to in a service agreement, because nobody reads it. We're in a trust relationship. We're assuming that there's a certain amount of responsibility being taken with our data, and that we're going to be treated a certain way. It doesn't really matter what the subtext is. It's our intention that really law needs to be defined on. And we passed a law this year in Vermont, Act 205, that creates a fiduciary responsibility around a company that claims itself to be a personal data protection company. That got changed from the word trust in the last minute, <clears throat> which is a key distinction. But what it does is it, it keeps it in the, uh, attorney, uh, in the Secretary of State's jurisdiction and allows us to work with companies to define a fiduciary responsibility around their holding of data. And, and I believe that that is a door opener for, to push the market, to push that data again into the user's hands. And once you put the data in the user's hands and you have established protocols and paywalls so that any participant, whether it's a big tech giant or it's a small startup tech company, has the same access to that data through a market interface, now 
not only can we attract the small tech companies from Vermont, but we can attract more residents because we've got the laws that get them paid for their social media usage. Right. And now we can meet the state's goals of bringing two or 3,000 more people into the state each year because they get better treatment from the world's companies. And I would propose that the state look into opportunities to create a public-private partnership to enlist companies to exercise that law that we've passed and to make sure that the state is involved in a way to get as much open source technology out of that and protocol knowledge out of that so that we can implement those tools for our state services while business can run with those tools and create a better ecosystem. What I like about these meetings, we have so many smart people. It's the follow up though. How do we, you know, so we gotta make sure we enter these information. Yeah. Uh, I do have a consulting firm based in White River Junction. And by the way, White River Junction is doing great. Looks beautiful. Awesome. It's a nice little town. It really Big is. Coffee. <laughs> were you at our were you, were you at our meeting no, in White River? Just, I don't know that town. I just I just to to back that up. Um, I feel like this issue of monetizing private data is something that every Vermonter I know would get behind. I don't think you need to worry about them complaining about you spending money on lawsuits or or privacy officers if that's the sort of thing they're gonna be taken care of. And I think that my friends who would by choice spend a snow day tomorrow deer hunting will feel just as strongly about that as my friends who are gonna stay inside with a hipster podcast and a craft brew. Like, I think everybody will agree that, that is, that's what they want their government to be doing for them. Does that make anyone else want to craft <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts, suggestions, comments, ideas? Uh, this jumps back about 30 minutes ago to the point that the gentleman on the side here made about treating data as the same. It got me thinking about student privacy. Um, and student privacy is very important, and I certainly encourage that. But it raises the question of a, is Student privacy only a subset of a much larger question about children's privacy uh, and how best to serve that. And it really is something of, is there a sufficient framework in place to cover kids no matter where they are, whether they're in school, out of school, using school products or anything of that nature? Um, and shouldn't there be some consistency between how we think of data when it's at school and when kids are just on their own? Um, and whether there is a need like HIPAA that I was talking about before, COPA is already an also updated statute at the federal level um, that it only covers a subset of kids, it stops at 13, um, and it really has not kept pace with the way that kids interact with the world around them, um, and whether there's opportunities there to expand that reach uh, at the state level to both cover student privacy, but just kids' privacy as a broader concept. Is, well, this is something that actually came up in the context of the data broker working group. And one of the original recommendations of that working group was to take a hard look at children's privacy in the context of that third party sale of, of data and whether or not there was room to have a sort of Vermont style covering uh, essentially the same sort of COPPA framework, but for under 18, so you'd be capturing 17 to 13 were not contemplated by the federal law. And uh, I don't know, uh, if there, there are people in the room, I think, that were part, part of that working group process. And I'm just curious, I think at the time there were concerns about, well, wouldn't there be preemption questions? Have other states done this? And I just wonder, are you aware of other states that have acted in that area? Uh, you know, it seems to me that if you're covering a group that's not contemplated by COPPA altogether, I was never convinced that preemption was really an issue because this is a population that wasn't covered by the federal law. So I'm curious to get your take on that question and whether or not there are templates out there for activity in that area. To my knowledge, I think there are some. I think our home state of Illinois has one that has really barely ever been taken off the shelf. It does cover, I think, is it up to 16? 16. 16. So 14, 15, 16. Uh, but it is also an older law that had, that 
there is need, as the general has said a few times, it's a, you know, the question of every year you have to refresh this, but I think when a lot of these laws were written, in the first instance, they were not envisioning anything that was coming. And we now have a better handle on the ecosystem that we're in um, and can, I think, better future-proof protect <coughs> people. Um, so I think there are opportunities to do that to improve on what's already out there. Okay. Slightly different topic, but we were talking about data security earlier. Um, you know, one big aspect of this whole conversation is that we all uh, entrust businesses with our data on a daily basis, um, and we assume that those businesses are taking reasonable steps to protect that data. Uh, we know that a lot of these businesses are not, because they're constantly data breaches. Uh, we hear about them every day. Um, and not just the collection of our data, but also um, what Internet of Things products. So you can go online and buy a $40 security camera or, or nanny camera that's cloud-based and put it in your home and then you can view your kid on uh, your iPhone, but that nanny camera is hackable. And someone else can be watching your kid through that same camera. And that's not a theoretical harm, it's happened. It's happened multiple times. We know that uh, cameras, you know, speakers, you know, all these surveillance tools that we're putting in our homes, heck, refrigerators, televisions, are hacked. Um, the Attorney General's Office has spent a lot of effort enforcing data security under our Consumer Protection Act. Uh, we have interpreted the Consumer Protection Act to say you have to have reasonable data security. Um, and it's, as has pretty much every other Attorney General's Office and the Federal Trade Commission. But there are only, there are very, very few actual, there are hundreds of settlements that bear this out, but very few legal decisions that actually uphold the legal theory that all of the enforcers have, and none in Vermont and none in the Second Circuit. Um, we all rely on the Third Circuit decision. So some states have implemented laws that rather than just relying on our, it's an unfair act or it's a deceptive act, they say you have to have reasonable data security. And if you don't, that's an unfair act. Um, there's probably about a dozen states that have done that. So that's something that we could consider doing. I would argue it wouldn't actually change the obligations of businesses, it would just clarify them. And not just for businesses that hold on to our data, but businesses that produce products that could hold on to data, that produce apps that hold on to data, or that provide services to other businesses where it's assumed that they will hold on to data. In the medical area under HIPAA, there's already a security rule that says, you know, if you're working with a company that has HIPAA data, you have to have a certain level of security too. But that only applies within that industry, within that area. So, you know, th there's a question as to whether or not it would be enough to just say everyone has to have reasonable data, and that alone would raise things, or to go one step further and say, and here's what we mean by reasonable data. Um, and. I have heard a lot of arguments from the business community that they would like that, that they would like to hear what exactly we mean. I don't know what that would look like if we actually tried to do it, but um, that's something else to consider that might you know, be helpful in this area. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a fair point because one thing we, we know for, for, in order to have uh, a, a landscape that treats everybody fairly and, and equally, you know, to the extent that you can provide certainty to the business community, that I know is generally desirable for the for the business community. So they kind of know what the rules of the road are. Um, and uh, the attorney general is always talking about building a culture of compliance in Vermont. So we do a lot of public public education and awareness and reaching out to communities and trying to find out what is uh, where are the trouble spots and what what can we do about it. So to the extent that we could remove some uncertainty by sort of saying, here, here are the, the bright lines. This is what it means. Um, maybe that would be a help to, to everybody. Um, certainly worth, worth having a conversation. Yes, sir. I don't recall where this went, but there was a conversation around right to repair, talking yeah. about hardware standards. Um, that's a key component to all this, where that intersects, and that you know, the hardware manufacturers basically, basically they write the rules if we're not careful about maintaining certain guidelines on how those things are put together and there's you know it's always like you said you know things are constantly coming to light that are hacked and hackable and there's two things one we can try to prevent hacking but there's also 
disincentivizing by breaking down those silos, but there's also just awareness, and it's being able to design and define systems that can be implemented that make sure that at least if it does get hacked, you know that something's been hacked, so you know when the data's been corrupted, you know when the microphone's been accessed, and there's no questioning or falsifying that data record, you can see, okay, the, you know, that, that camera was accessed three times when I accessed it, and be able to verify that there wasn't some other uh, breach of that. So, you know, all those things I think have to come together, and maybe that's, you know, again, where there's a place for that chief officer position, or simply a, a sort of recognition of where collaboration has to happen between these different initiatives. I'm, I'm glad you raised it. There is a right to repair a working group for anybody that's interested. Uh, that is chaired by a member of the House and the Senate, uh, Senator Pearson and, and Representative Hill. Um, that they're actually meeting on Monday, and I'm a participant in that working group as well. Uh, so a lot of interesting discussions are, are coming out. I think one of the questions that frankly has come up that we I don't think there's been an answer to, but that comes up is about this issue of, of security because um, some of the manufacturers will say of particular kinds of products that one of the things we build into our products is a certain amount of security. So if you eliminate that and we no longer know or control how that that those systems are protected because uh, a third party, whether the consumer themselves or a small repair shop, now it's out of our control, so we don't know what's going on with the product and we can't protect it anymore. So there's a question about is that opening up a can of worms and all of this, but but also to your point, you know, could could there be more and better security features? And so there, there are both sides of that coin. It's, it's come up. And I don't think there's been a conclusion to that, but it's just part of the discussion. It's an interesting one. Yeah. I was just going to add to that, um, like when you're looking for what's really objective, easy way to follow, in many cases there are international standards that you know, many technologies or in, in any industry builds to, and I know that's what we look for, is what, what standards they're even if not actually implemented, but what standards they're to also use an audible tool to, to measure compliance, because we're looking at how to build these things together, even as part of legislation, what, what is an ISO, what is a standard that may already exist that you know, companies kind of try to build to, but don't necessarily adhere to, but if it's put into, if that's a reasonable standard to adopt, and that's something that has an international body, which is what you're really looking at, or a national body, that's something like this standard, but what are some standards already out there that already outline, because um, there are for data security, there are for technology, there's all sorts of things for trustworthy systems, all, so anything that's kind of sounds vague, there are real international standards that can be, be looked at to, that can be put into legislation, so it kind of takes out that, but it puts it in the hands of the person or the company to actually adhere to. Um, but it does have audibility, which is the key part is the measuring compliance or where something comes from. Yeah, the problem with security being tied to the manufacturer is that then when the manufacturer is breached, everything out of that manufacturer is breached. And, and in, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, but in most cases when you get a technologist or technology company saying something is too complicated, it's a complete cop out. <laughs> <laughs> they just know it costs something. So just know we're at the hour mark and I have a 15 minute ride home. I have to get home for bedtime reading, so I'm leaving. I'm gonna turn it over to Charity Clark to, to run this, um, unless, you should conclude this. Um, I know Chris and Charity and Ryan and Clay are happy to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even if, if everybody else leaves, yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, Let's talk to you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Other thoughts, comments, uh, suggestions? Yeah. Just um, really wanted to say one of the reasons I was interested to come here and um, learn more about this topic is because of the deep concerns that I have, especially of the net neutrality. Um, and a lot of times consumers, citizens, don't have either choices. They either they only have one company to choose or maybe two companies to choose from. So that whole free market thing is not really happening. Um, or they don't have the time to spend all of their time researching and saying, OK, well, OK, now I'm going to buy a crock pot. I'm going to find out which one's the least hackable. Um, so we really do depend uh, on the government to take that, you know, to, to protect us in that measure because, you know, there is only so much we can do as individuals. Yeah. 
So I really do appreciate the, the deep thought that is going into this process and being able to attend this hearing um, as a citizen and just that Vermont is moving towards um, as much protection as possible for the citizens, um, even though this is a difficult subject to parse out. Yeah, thank you. I think net neutrality is a great example. You know, you had executive order, you had legislation, um, and now we're in litigation. And there's litigation at the federal level, obviously here in Vermont, and it's navigating all these different landscapes with the goal, though, of protecting Vermonters. And how do we do that most effectively? Um, understanding, again, for me, I, I, I'm really stuck on this question. Can the law keep pace with technology? Uh, I'm very, I'm not sure it can. I'm, I'm not sure it can. I would just argue that the, the, the people writing the law didn't become technology. Well, that's, that, right? but that's the, code, that's the I mean, point of the foundational code work that, we, that I agree with you. Yeah. But if, if you know, uh, we have a citizen legislature. Right. No, I understand. Uh, but my, my point being that the term code of law is, is a thousand, multi thousand year old term. Code is code, it's if then else. It's, it's really, we're doing the same thing we've been doing for thousands of years. We just have to, you know, hire a high school kid to type it out for us. But at the same time, <laughs> it's if then else. So to the point of, you know, implementing technology, I think sometimes we're, we're so caught up in trying to implement uh, regulation or legislation because that, that is, that's the code we know. But if we can put resources towards getting the people employed by the state to be digging into the technology and the solutions that are out there by international standards bodies, Vermont can be a leader in implementing solutions. Things like net neutrality is great, litigate, don't litigate. If we decentralize the name systems, then we de-identify the traffic. And now they can't pick and choose what traffic they're going to control. And now net neutrality is actually an obsolete concept. So the, the, the consensus I'm hearing is that on the how is to develop the subject matter expertise within state government. <clears throat> Agree with you 100%. Yeah. Be, because if we don't, we're doing this, <laughs> and you know, which is fine, and I'm happy to do it. But we're also then caught up in lawsuits or lawsuits. We'll do our job. We're by there. Thank you. I must say, you're already doing way better than the Senate did when they were interviewing Mark Zuckerberg. So <laughs> <laughs> you've got a good head start. Well, thank you. <laughs> you, know, you, you. You make a good point about developing the expertise within government. And you know, maybe part of the solution is we, we have a lot of the expertise in government now spread out throughout yeah. different parts. And, and a, lot of the, a lot of the efforts are basically by those people seeking each other out and meeting with each other. Maybe the solution or part of the solution might be a reorganization of saying, you know, all of these problems, you know, we have DFR that says, you know, we need expertise to look at finances and insurance and, you know, they need to focus on those. You know, we have people who are looking at utilities. Maybe the answer is that we need to kind of like rejigger how we're looking at this and say we need a commission or an agency or something that is focusing on, and maybe that's a chief privacy officer, but, but that's more of an inward looking, not, not an outward looking. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's a longer term, you know, you know, thinking about it that way. I can give you an example just in the night of that, but I mean, we just wrote a white paper with one staff member related to GDPR. So, and it's national, so it got pushed out. Finding a collaborator in state government that one understood it as well as we did, knew all the factors for it, was impossible, was difficult. And about it is a real, in many ways we're set up in a certain structure and it's about collaboration and it's really about willingness to collaborate. Um, where when you're talking about technology and government, and I was talking about standards, the one entity or area that don't get much use of standards but really good technology is our own internal. Yeah. Not talking about Secretary of State's office per se, but we're so third party, we're internally sometimes having the lack of expertise in turn on the, and the technology to build those systems and understand them in and out is no longer here. We have, we have switched as a state um, very much to have developers and computer scientists to just basically act applications and third party. Um, so, so I think there's a focus here of being you know, small enough to, to have the idea to collaborate and understand these things and build the expertise in and even negotiating those contracts with the vendors can be a challenge. Absolutely. We don't have the expertise to know what we I should know. be asking for. And I see this sometimes. Yeah. 
But um, but that's true. I, but I, it's been a shift, you know. So it's, it's more in many ways having those skill sets. We've lost some of those um, over the, like the last decade or so based on the way we have approached the state technology and data. I don't see any more hands. <laughs> the, the snow's supposed to start coming at 7 p.m. Somebody already called that it's going to be a snow day tomorrow. Me. Don't <laughs> 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 No, we're always open. We're always open. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take my leave. Uh, I'm going to conclude the hearing, unless, but feel free to stay in chat. This auditorium is ours until <laughs> 7 o'clock. So thank you all. Thanks for coming, everybody.